praying for me and for this congregation. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. How sweet and wonderful it is. And you know the opposite of that is how unpleasant it is when brethren don't dwell together in unity. Of course, that, that certainly certainly is true. I count it a great blessing and privilege to stand before you tonight. Though unworthy, and I'm not to get up here tonight and tell you how unworthy I am, you, you know that we all are. But I certainly feel my insufficiency. And if I have any sufficiency tonight, my sufficiency is in the Lord. My trust and my hope is in Him. I see some faces that I am so, so glad to see tonight. All of you, so happy to see you. Thank God for this wonderful opportunity to come back to this part of God's moral vineyard here among you. I've enjoyed the fellowship so sweetly and so wonderfully after ser- but before and after service last night and then today and so forth and on. It's just been a wonderful, wonderful season. Wonderful, wonderful time. I do have things upon my mind this mo- tonight that I trust that I would be able to preach. There's things on my mind that I need to get off my mind. But uh, God knows all about that. But I trust, because I, I can't get it all told. Somebody said, well, you ought to try to get started. Well, that's true, and I will in just a moment. Lord willing, I'm going to try, try to get started. Uh, I'm going to turn tonight to 2 Timothy chapter 4. And the subject matter tonight would be upon some things that we ought to keep. Now, I am certainly not going to be able to exhaust this subject. First and foremost, I'm not capable of exhausting it. Second of all, there's not time to exhaust it. And uh, But there's three or four ever how the Lord would leave what we get to and some things round and about it. And I trust the Lord will give me travel of mind tonight and I'll say some things and and, uh, touch upon some thoughts and subject matter that will be directed that God God knows where it needs to go. Amen. God knows uh, who needs it and how they need it and so forth and on. And, uh, you know, we're not just fighting as trying to beat the air. We're not just going through an exercise. But, but we're trying to do that which is a, a, of, a, of a spiritual exercise. Amen. And pray that God would bless it with His uh, very uh, presence and His Spirit tonight. I believe that there is that of the Spirit of preaching. And we need the Spirit of preaching. Peter said, I, we preach with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Right. Now, I don't preach with the same measure the apostles had, and no man does since the apostles. But brothers and sisters, there's a measure of God's Spirit that He blesses and that He gives unto men that He calls. And I still believe in a god call ministry. Amen. I believe that God calls men to preach, and He qualifies them, and He blesses them, yeah. and He uh, helps them, and gives them uh, that that they need if they will apply themselves and study to show themselves approved unto God. And uh, it's like a two-sided coin. Uh, It's a two-way street, if you please. There's that that God does, and then there's that that God teaches us from our Word to do. From his word to do, and it's just like in so many things. Uh, uh, there's eternal applications in God's word, and there's timely applications right here and now. And I tell you that there's more timely admonitions and instructions. Uh, uh, and in the way of righteousness, all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable for reproof and correction and exhortation and uh, instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be truly, thoroughly uh, furnished unto all good works. Uh, uh, That's not uh, 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 the preacher, the man of God. Certainly he's included. uh, That includes male and female. Uh, that includes uh, uh, all of God's children that we go to the Scriptures and as I said last night that the Scriptures, they are our only rule of faith and practice. Uh, We need to speak where the Scriptures
Scriptures speak and be silent where the Scriptures are silent. Amen. We need what thus saith uh, the Word of God. Now, as I said, there's some things that I'd like to uh, light upon tonight if the Lord be pleased concerning things that we ought to keep. There's many more in the Scripture, uh, but we'll... Uh, uh, endeavor to go as, uh, as we have time and direction. The Lord would bless us and help us to do so. But since last night, we endeavored to preach upon the subject matter of the faith of the gospel, uh, the doctrine of faith, the truth uh, uh, of faith, of what we believe, our belief. Uh, uh, i tell you what, before I read there in 2 Timothy, let me just turn back over to uh, the Gospel of Luke there in chapter 1 and pick up a couple of verses uh, that will help us right there with this. And I told you last night, uh, those of you that were here, uh, that it does matter what we believe. And it's important for our well-being Right here in this life, it's important for our psyche. It's important for our mind. It's important for our comfort. It's important for our uh, peace while we live right here on the shores of time. Here in Luke, uh, in verse 1, and then for the sake of time, we'll go down to verse 4. But he says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Even as Luke writes, and it's still the, the same today, that there are things, there's doctrinal truths, there's the faith, uh, uh, the doctrine, uh, uh, the practice, the order, the discipline of the church that Jesus built uh, uh, here upon this earth. Uh, uh, there are those things things uh, which are most surely believed among us. Uh, and we hold forth to these. These are basic tenets of faith, uh, 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 beliefs of faith, uh, the doctrine of faith, the, fa the faith that Paul preached that once he destroyed, but now he preached. Uh, and the faith uh, uh, that he lived by the faith of the Son of God, by the doctrine, by the teachings uh, of the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, so we still hold forth uh, that there there are those things that are most surely believed among us. There are such cardinal, fundamental, foundational uh, doctrines of uh, uh, teaching. That's what the word doctrine means. It just simply means teaching. When it says they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, it means that they continue steadfastly in the apostles' teachings. What the apostles were teaching them. And fellowship. Uh, they were in fellowship with the apostles. Uh, you know, uh, uh, today you hear a lot, well, are you in fellowship with this one? Are you in fellowship with that one? I want to tell you who we ought to be in fellowship with, and that's the apostles. Uh, you said, well, uh, uh, where are they? Well, they're dead and gone. Uh, it's the same ones, but they are here with us in the Word of God. Uh, they're the same ones as I tried to preach on that point last night also uh, uh, from God's Word. We still have uh, uh, their exhortations and admonitions and rebukes and corrections uh, uh, and their teaching uh, uh, that they gave and set forth uh, uh, there in the first century uh, to the church uh, uh, that Jesus built, uh, that He established here upon this earth. Uh, and she is but one. In verse 4, it says that thou mightest know the certainty of those things. Uh, verse 1 tells us uh, uh, that there are things that are most surely believed. Uh, and then now He says, I'm writing uh, that you would know the certainty of those things, that you would be persuaded in those things, uh, that you would uh, uh, esteem those things, that you would cherish, that you would prize uh, uh, those things. Uh, this is God's precious Word. Uh, this is the Gospel. This is the old, old story. Uh, as mentioned last night, uh, amen, of what God has done uh, for an undeserving people, but a people that God uh, loved uh, Long ere before the world began, uh, before uh, He created, before Genesis 1 and 1, in the mind and purpose of God. You remember God saved nobody before the foundation of the world, but He purposed to save. Amen. A people.
people. And He came in time. He sent His Son in the fullness of time. God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that are under the law. God sent Jesus. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus, that He is our chief apostle. And the very word apostle means sent one. He is the first among the apostles, if you please. He was sent. You know, there was also, the Bible tells us that John the Baptist was sent. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's what the Bible says. And God sent forth His apostles. He sent forth laborers and ministers. And pray ye that the Lord of the harvest will send forth laborers. Amen. It's God that does the sending. It's not mama called and daddy sent. Amen. It's God. Amen. Sent. It's God oh, that lays the burden. No one and no church should place a burden upon a man to preach that God hadn't called him to preach because you're asking him to bear something he can't bear because you or the church can't help him bear that burden. Only God that calls amen, can help bear the burden. And God will. I tell you, somebody talking about preaching, I I said to someone one time, if you can get out of it, get out of it. Amen. I did because if you can get out of it, you hadn't been called. But if you can't get out of it, if it stays with you, then I want to tell you, the Lord's going to help you. The Lord's going to be with you. The Lord's going to be an encourager to you. And though all men forsake you when it what it seems like from time to time, but yet the Lord will stand by you and finally at last He'll deliver you into that heavenly kingdom. Amen. So, uh, uh, there are things that are most surely believed among us. This is the faith. This is the faith. Those things that are surely believed among us. It's different from fruit of the Spirit faith. Amen. It is different uh, from the faithfulness of God. Amen. The faith, the gospel, the, the gospel, the faith of the gospel. So as we begin this thought tonight... Uh, uh, far as concerning uh, uh, things that we ought to keep. Uh, we, as we turn there to 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, the very last epistle that the Apostle Paul writes, uh, and, and according uh, to uh, church history and so forth, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, at this time, he's in prison. Uh, he is in uh, a very secluded place. He, he's in a hard place. Of course, when he first went to Rome, he was two years years in his own hired house. Uh, uh, things were different, but then finally he was put uh, into uh, uh, a, a pit like of a prison. Uh, uh, there it was hard and so forth. Uh, uh, but as he is uh, closing out his final writings, uh, uh, as he is coming down to the closing out of his life and he feels that the end is near, uh, he says these words uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, For I am now ready to be offered. Uh, I'm ready for the oh, ultimate offering, amen, which would be His life, uh, the giving of His very life in martyrdom uh, for the cause of the uh, of the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. Uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, uh, he bore his cross. Uh, you, you see, you can't, and, and the brother, uh, brother Mike stirred up my mind about the cross there, uh, you can't bear the Lord's cross. Uh, you've got to bear your cross. Uh, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him first deny himself and take up his cross. His cross and follow me. Uh, there's a cross, uh, amen, of, of self-sacrifice. Uh, there's a, a that cross uh, that calls upon you to deny yourself, uh, to give yourself wholly unto the Lord, uh, whereby you would have to absent, uh, you'd have to miss some things that would pleasure the flesh or, or so forth. Uh, uh, but uh, in order uh, to be the 
humble, willing, obedient servant to be the disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ to exercise your spiritual senses and not to focus upon your natural senses and enticements and yield to those things. Amen. But to sharpen and to exercise and to use your spiritual senses in service unto the Lord. You know, when so many people think about the cross, they think about the two pieces of wood. But I want to tell you, that's not the main focus. You see, the Lord only carried those two pieces of wood, that cross, that wooden cross, for just a probably just a very few moments as He was leaving the judgment hall and ascending up Mount Calvary, Golgotha, Armageddon. He was ascending up that hill outside of Jerusalem, outside the gates where the evening sacrifice amen, would be made. He would be the evening sacrifice. And He was trying to carry those two pieces of wood and He was already in such a physical condition uh, that he fell beneath the weight of it and the load of it. Uh, he was physically exhausted uh, and one was compelled to take up the wooden cross and carry it. Uh, but I want you to listen to me now and, and I want you to hear this uh, and I want you to consider it and consider it well. Uh, I tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, He began at the time of His conception uh, in the lower uh, parts of the earth in the womb of the virgin to Mary, he began to bear his cross. When the Bible says, Jesus said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Oh, I want to tell you, he came down. We're not talking about a geographical up descending down. Uh, we think of heaven above and yes, anytime you see the word heaven, uh, you can give it the definition of a heaved up, lifted up place. It will work anywhere in the scripture that you see heaven, whatever the context is. Uh, I mean, whether it's speaking of heaven above or heaven below. Uh, far as down here, uh, the kingdom of heaven and so forth, which is a messianic term. But nevertheless, uh, amen, the spiritual experience of the kingdom of God is a heaved up, lifted Lifted up place. Oh, so what I'm telling you is that He came down. He condescended. He he stooped. He bowed. He lowered Himself. He condescended to the low estate. Amen. A man. He was made like unto His brethren. Unto His brethren which are His elect. That was given unto Him in the everlasting covenant of grace. Even before time before Genesis 1 and 1 when God the Father purposed to save and God the Son amen the word in the bosom of the Father amen would be made flesh and come down to this earth amen God came down to this earth in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and from that time that he condescended and Lord and came down and was as the babe in the womb of the Virgin Mary he began to bear his cross of sacrifice and self-denial and he bore that cross until even all the way and through his death his burial and when did he quit bearing that cross when God raised him from the dead amen Peter said twice there in in Acts 2 Paul in his preaching in Acts chapter 13 that God raised him from the dead Jesus said I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it up again but I tell you that God raised him from the dead he was raised for our justification amen when he came forth raised from the dead by the father it signified that God amen was well pleased and satisfied and that the elect of God were justified in the eternal halls of God's eternal justice and there was nothing to their account somebody sings the old account was settled long ago I only tell you it's a lot longer than they think about it was settled some 2,000 years ago on the tree of the cross when Christ was suspended and hung between heaven and earth I'm about to get happy Amen. he hung between heaven 
and earth. He was suspended there. Amen. He endured uh, the contradiction of sinners. He was separate from sinners. No guile in his mouth. He was the perfect eternal a son of God, the Lamb of God, but yet in human form come down without sin to die for poor sinners that God had given him in that everlasting covenant. Oh, as Jesus said, uh, that he had power over all flesh. Amen. To give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Amen. Thank God the Father gave him a people. This is the gospel Paul wrote. This is the gospel he preached. Somebody said, I'd love to hear, I'd love to have heard the Apostle Paul preach. Well, just read his sermons in the Bible. Amen. Just read what he wrote. Because he wrote what he preached and he preached what he wrote. Oh, yes. He didn't speak out of both sides of his mouth. He didn't, it didn't matter to him who and where the congregation was. He didn't have one sermon if he was among these folks and another sermon if he was among them folks. Amen. It was one sermon. Amen. It was the doctrine of the Son of God. Amen. That he lived by and that he preached and that he embraced. And now he's ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. Oh, it was about time to leave. It was about home going time. For the Apostle Paul, he was about to lay down the cross of sacrifice and self-denial and all of the things that he endured for the elect's sake, that along with eternal salvation that they could also have the blessings of timely deliverances. Amen. That's why he suffered. That's why he traveled about. Was for the benefit, for the edification and the building up, amen, of the Lord's people, the disciples to encourage them. You know, the Bible says when Barnabas went down uh, there to uh, Antioch, it says uh, that he saw the grace of God. And when he had saw the grace of God, somebody said, can you see the grace of God? Yes, it was evident. Amen. It was evident among them uh, that he encouraged them to continue, amen, in the grace of God. In other words, words. Uh, you know, his very name uh, Barnabas means encourager. Uh, he encouraged the folks to keep on keeping on. Uh, I encourage you to keep on keeping on. Not in order to have a home in heaven, but because of your hope, uh, your earnest expectation, uh, and because of what the Lord has done for you, and that the Lord has been so good to you, uh, and that the Lord has been with you all the days of your life, uh, and He's delivered you and blessed you from harms and danger seen and unseen of things that could have snuffed you out. Hardships that could have caused you a lot of trouble here. Amen. The Lord delivered. Oh, how good the Lord is to us. Oh, how good and wonderful. I think as the psalmist said, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, a few weeks ago when I was reading that, Brother Mike, uh, there was an image coming to my mind. And I think about the sister that's talking about her little dog today. You know, and what image come in my mind was a little puppy dog uh, following a child around. And everywhere that child was going, that little puppy dog was right on its heels and everything. Oh, I want to tell you, goodness and mercy. It's like that little puppy dog. It's just following you around. Amen. Wherever you go. Oh, encouraging you from time to time. Uh, you can just feel a little nipping on your heels to let you know. Uh, amen. That goodness uh, <laughs> and mercy is there. Yeah. And that God is with you. And God has not left you. That He'll never forsake you. He'll never leave you alone. Uh, even in the darkest times of the midnight. Uh, weeping may endure for a night. Uh, but thank God that joy cometh uh, in the morning. Uh, oh, uh, in those depths of midnight. Sometimes you can only drop the anchor and wish for the day. Oh, uh, and it seems so long the night. But He's the God of the night. I want to tell you the God of the day. He's still God in the night. And the God uh, in the on the mountain. He's still God in the valley. Thank God forevermore. You know, there's some folks wanted to change up where they're fighting the children of Israel because they thought their God was just a God of that geographical place. So they chose another place. Amen. 
uh, besides the valley, go the mountain or the mountain and go the valley. Oh, and, and try to see what you can do. Oh, see if their God would deliver them. Well, they found out it didn't matter if it's on the mountain or in the valley that God was the same. God's the same on the mountain. He's the same in the valley. Oh, though I walk, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Amen. A lot of times we pass through the shadow, through the shadow of death. Amen. Death could occur. You know, from the time you're born to the time you breathe out your last, death is on your heels. Oh, yes, it is. There's many opportunities. There's many things there. Oh, but I'm glad that those providential things, amen, is in God's hands. And as I told folks, even at the time of COVID, I said, listen, folks, don't be so afraid. Don't be so frightful. The power of life and death is still in God's hands. God can still overrule and to live as Christ and to Dies gain and never die, sink or swim. I'm the Lord's, amen. By His grace and by His mercy. So you see, it just don't matter, amen. It just don't matter. We're the Lord's, oh, we're His, and oh, He's coming back. And those at that are His at His coming, oh, He's going to take them home to be with Him. The Apostle Paul, my departure's at hand. You know, you go to the airport. Or down to the bus depot or the train station, whatever, that ticket has got a departure time there. You know, there's a departure. Paul felt that that time was near him. That time was nearing upon him. Now, I don't believe that you have a predetermined time to die. Now, some of you may believe that. If you do, that's okay. We're not going to fall out with it, all right? But I believe, uh, as the scripture teaches, uh, that there, uh, now there is a time to die. Amen. It don't mean it's an appointed time. It just means there's going to be a time that you can no longer hold on to natural life, either by accident, disease, sickness, or murder, or whatever that it is. But God, but you see, we can, there's scriptures, plenty of scriptures that teach us that we can shorten and we can lengthen our life. You know, so we have to take that in consideration. So that's not what he's talking about, but he felt that the end was coming for him. He realized that he was going to be martyred. He realized oh, that, that his departure was at hand. And what does he say? He says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Yes. Amen. This is something that we need to keep. Yes. We need to keep the faith. We need to stand in the faith. We need to stand firm in the faith as we tried to preach last night. Amen. This gospel faith, what we believe, what we hold forth unto, what we cherish, what we understand, the life that the Lord, amen, has given to us. Uh, if, if the witness in God's Word rightly divided, we need to hold fast to it and hold forth to it and hold fast to the faith of the old patriarchs of old and those that have blazed the trail, amen, behind us. Uh, uh, even uh, under the New Testament economy, uh, there of John the Baptist who stood between the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. He said he wasn't uh, uh, the bridegroom, but he was a friend of the bridegroom. Uh, he he had a hold of the old and a hold of the new. Uh, he's the last Old, old Testament uh, prophet, and uh, if you please, the first New Testament prophet. The law and the prophets were until John. But now is the kingdom of God preached, and every man presseth into it. Yeah. Amen. You've got to press. You've got to press hard to keep the faith. What do you got to press against? You've got to press against the flesh, your anemic nature. Uh, that old nature, that old corrupt nature. You've got to press against it. You've got to press on and push through. Amen. There's many things in life. You just got to press on. You just got to push on through it by the help and by the grace of the Lord. That's why Paul told Timothy to be strong in the grace. Right. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. You can't entangle yourself 
Amen. With things of this life that sap your uh, fellowship and uh, uh, your rela- your uh, fellowship and, and your experience uh, uh, with God in a temporal sense. I'm glad nothing can change sonship. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad that nothing changes sonship? It's legal. It's binding. Amen. You just took out of Adam's family, chose out, treasured out in Christ. Amen. Put into the family of God by birth and adoption. Oh, how sweet and how wonderful that is. I have kept the faith. So it is incumbent upon us, brothers and sisters, that uh, we cherish, that we esteem, that we hold forth to, that we won't let go of uh, the faith as it is uh, the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, Pilate asked that question, what is truth? Right. A lot of folks seek and want to know what is truth. I'll tell you, God didn't God did not write this Bible so hard, Amen, for you not to understand some things. Amen. Amen. I but you see what man has blurred it. And man may blurt it for you. Amen, I tell you there was a time uh, that I that the light didn't have the light, didn't didn't have the brightness of it, didn't have the illumination. Uh, and, and that's that's what Paul was praying for his brethren in Romans chapter ten. Uh, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. He wasn't praying for their eternal salvation. He wasn't praying for them to be saved in heaven in mortal glory. He said uh, that they had a zeal of God. If if you got a zeal of God, it's from God. That's right. Amen. It's from God. It's because of God. It's because of what God has done. But he said they're going about to us try to establish their own righteousness. But said Christ is the end, amen, of, of, of righteousness as far as, as, as the law is concerned. Uh, to everyone that believeth. So if you'll believe the truth as it is in Christ, if you'll hold fast, amen, to the doctrine of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it is liberating. And that's what Paul was praying for them, for his uh, fellow brethren, his kinsmen uh, in the flesh, but yet they were children of God. Amen. You know, I don't see any need to pray that God will save the elect in heaven. Amen. God's going to do that. God's going to do that. But I pray God would save His people right here in time. Save them from ignorance. Amen. Save them to truth. Save me from ignorance. Save me to truth. Save me from darkness of understanding to light of understanding. And that's what Paul was praying for for them. And he talked about how that it came. You know, the usual and customary manner. And I mentioned this last night. Amen. And the continuation of the faith. Not talking about fruit of the Spirit faith. I want to tell you that God is the author and finisher of that faith. You understand? Amen. Hebrews chapter 2 and ver- chapter 12 verse 2. Amen. That He is the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. And that's in the same sense with the Philippians as the Apostle Paul said uh, that God that hath begun this good work in you, Philippians 1 and 6, that He will perform it. In other words, He will keep it going. It will stay alive. It won't die out. It won't change. You won't lose it. Amen. I want to tell you, you may fall in God's hand, but you won't fall out. Amen. Amen. You understand that? It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. That means His people fall in in judgment, in chastisement, right here in this life. Amen. You may fall in His hand, but you won't fall out. And no man can pluck you out of His hand and or Jesus' hand. And as the Apostle Paul said at the the end of Romans chapter 8 there, when he's going through all of those things, that laundry list, if you please, uh, that cannot separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. He said, nor any other creature. You know what helped me the most with that? For I was raised up in an order and it was my understanding that you could apostatize, you could lose uh, your born again experience. You stood in jeopardy every hour. But you know when I come to understand and to see uh, when it says, nor any other creature, I realized I was a creature and that included me and even me could not separate myself amen from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus isn't that good news now that's the better story is it not 
amen, than what folks have today. Uh, you know, there's an order of folks back home, and I guess there are other places too. Uh, I don't care. They're called free holiness. And, uh, and they hold forth, and they don't even want their children and teenagers to come forth and to quote unquote receive Christ and go through that and so forth. Uh, they want them to wait till they get older after they sowed their wild oats because if uh, they come forth and receive Christ and they're saved and then they backslide, then they're eternally lost and there's no hope in the world for them. Now how you like to live under that? How would you like one of them puppies? No, sir. Not whatsoever. Now, we understand the love of God to a great degree because the Scripture teaches us and because of what we experience of His love in our heart. And then, and, and from God's Word, uh, especially there, those verses, I love them. In 1 John chapter 3, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Right now at this time where the Son... The Bible says that He has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Why? Because you are sons. Yeah. He don't send the Spirit of His Son in, in, into one of His elects to make them His elect. No! They're already His elect by choice. Amen. Before the foundation of the world, by His eternal decree, uh, His eternal purpose, uh, His eternal Godhead, uh, if you please. Uh, and, 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 and so, uh, God's people, they are His people, uh, but they, just like Jesus had to come and do that legal work, as His elect come along in time, as Jesus said, ye must be born again. Right. That work has to take place. Yes, and you are totally passive in it. Right. Amen. He is active. You know when the Lord called forth Lazarus? Lazarus, He, he had no action. Amen. He is totally passive passive in coming forth. Christ called Him forth from the tomb. He just came floating out. Amen. Why? Because He is still bound up in grave clothes. He didn't walk out of there. He is bound up, the Bible says. And then what did the Lord say? He told them standing around, you loose Him and let Him go. Amen. Somebody said uh, the work of the, of the gospel preacher is to stand at the tomb and call Him forth. No! No! That's the Lord's work. Amen. It's the Lord's work to stand at the mouth of the tomb and to say, Live! Right. Amen. To say, Come forth! Yeah. He said, The hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. That's dead in trespass and sin. Shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live! Amen. Now what's the, what's the job of the gospel preacher in the church? It's to remove the grave clothes. Right. It's to help get the stink off of them. Yeah. Amen. Remove the grave clothes and help them to clean up, get the stink off of them. Tell them how they ought to walk and how they ought to talk in a way to please the Lord. Yeah. Now I believe that's having the tractor before the plow. You know, years ago I used to say, don't, don't get the plow before the horse. The horse pulls the plow. Well, we're so far removed from the farm, people can't understand that. So I changed it to the tractor and plow, you know. And the, the tractor pulls the plow. The plow don't pull the tractor. Amen. Right? Yeah, we're the plow. The Lord's the tractor in, in my allegory. <laughs> Amen. So it, it's Him and it's His work. And there's no action until there's life. Action, all a life always comes before action. We always got to remember that. That is a firm principle. So when we behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Oh, the manner, the love of God. For God so loved. This is the depth. This is the height of God's love for His elect. For His people that He chose and treasured. And sent His Son to die for. And to give Himself a ransom. And to die in our room and in our stead. So then now, that brings us to this next point of keep. This verse in Jude 21. And this is what a lot of folks get kind of tangled up with. Amen. Thinking that, you know, you're leaving grace or you're 
You're you're you're leaving. Uh, I want to tell you, all of God's word squares. Amen. It, it is a systematic truth. Yes, sir. When you rightly divide, Amen. It all fits together like a hand in glove. Amen. But here as Jude is closing out. He Jude's the one. Remember that that he said back in verse three, and we went through it last night uh, for us to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Uh, that gospel faith, that doctrinal faith, and now he tells them. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves. Yeah. Here's another admonition of keep. We're to keep the faith and we are to keep ourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. This is not telling you to do anything about attracting uh, or uh, getting God uh, to love you right. or uh, to keep God loving you. No, this is definitely talking about the grace and favor of God, that love which which God loves His people. And we're exhorted to keep ourselves in it. This is in a temporal way. This is in a manifested way. This is in a way of discipleship. Uh, This is that we set it before us. That we set the love of God before us. That we see the love of God. That we view the love of God. That we meditate upon God's love. Uh, That understanding the love of God, uh, that it will help us uh, to keep ourselves away from the things of the world that would pollute us and contaminate us and that would hinder our fellowship with the Lord. The Bible teaches us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Amen. I want to tell you, if God's people's love in the world, then the love of God is not dwelling in them richly. It's not being manifested. It's not coming forth. It doesn't remove God's love from them. Amen. But, but we're not esteeming God's love. We're not appreciating God's love. We're snuffing the nose at God's love. So we are to keep ourselves in a manifested way uh, in the love of God to set it before us, to keep it constantly in view. Keep it constantly in view before us. And to exercise faith upon it. Amen. To exercise that fruit of the Spirit uh, of faith, that of trust and confidence. Uh, amen. In our blessed Lord and that He loves us. And, and if we feel uh, that love of God in our heart, uh, you, you see the Bible teaches us that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Uh, when does He shed that love abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost? When we're born of the Spirit. When we're born again. Amen. That new creation uh, that comes in and cries out the Father. Uh, it's not you with the physical tongue and, and, and faculty uh, crying out the Father. But it's the Spirit. Amen. That comes in and takes the abode and cries, Abba, Father. And the love of God is shed abroad in our heart. And then as the Scripture says uh, uh, concerning that love, that we love Him because He first loved us. If He had not first loved us, we would never love Him. We would never love Him if He had not first loved us. And if He had not shed... You can't know real love. You can't manifest real love. You can't manifest and uh, exhibit uh, and have good works of charity. Charity is God's love in you in action. God's love in you in action. Amen. Charity, amen, is manifesting God's love. Amen. It is giving. It is working out. It is doing. We serve the Lord by serving others, right. by serving His people, and oh, uh, we don't, we shouldn't. The Lord taught that we shouldn't desire uh, the chief seat, we shouldn't desire the head seat. Uh, no, but we should desire the place of service. Yeah. Well, the servant is not greater than his Lord. No, our Lord's the greatest. But He said, "I have not called you servants, but I've called you friends." Yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. That, there it is in that sense. Oh, uh, and, and you know, he said, You call me Lord and Master, and so I am. <laughs> so I am. I am your Lord. I am your Master. I 
set forth example unto you. And of course that was in, in far as in the uh, washing of the saints' feet. But in every... Uh, ex- Lord's give us many examples. Amen. He being our Lord and Master. Examples that we should follow. And that we could, should follow in a way of service uh, unto each other. Uh, to do those good works of faith. Uh, you know the Apostle Paul, he understood and, and saw and uh, believed that the, uh, the Thessalonian brethren, uh, that they were the elect of God. Seeing brethren your election of God. He saw it. He he saw the evidence uh, that they were of the elect of God. He saw their good works of faith and their labors of love. uh, And it confirmed and showed forth uh, uh, that they were of God. And that they had received of God. For they were manifesting it out. And all that we would keep ourselves in the love of God, that we'd exercise that faith upon it, firmly believing our interest in it. Do you feel an interest? Yeah. Amen. In the love of God. Amen. If you feel an interest, that you have an interest in His love. Not because you were worthy, but because of the sovereignty of God. Because it pleased God. Amen. Because He was pleased uh, uh, to to love you. That you were one of the objects. uh, Amen. Of His love that He centered upon. uh, And that He loved. uh, uh, Loved you. uh, When you were yet without strength. uh, He died for you. uh, When uh, you could do nothing for yourself. uh, uh, He did it. uh, Unto Him be all the praise and all the glory. And all the honor unto His sweet and holy and wonderful name. In this keeping ourselves in the love of God, we preserve ourselves by the love of God. Amen. In a manifested way uh, that we love Him and and show forth that love. Therefore, it will help keep us, uh, amen, preserved uh, from the open and public and lifestyle of sin. Uh, Now, we're going to miss the mark. We're going to falter. We're going to fail. But I tell you, if you're keeping yourself in the love of God, you're not going to be living in a open shame and public way of sin. And the best example that I can give you of that is with Joseph. And in Genesis chapter 39 and verse 9, you know, leading up to that, how that Joseph, he was sold into Pharaoh's house when he went down into Egypt. And just immediately, Pharaoh's wife, she was in tree and she cast her eyes upon Joseph and she was out to get him. Uh, she tried, a, no doubt, a long time. Uh, time after time. Uh, whenever everyone would be gone, she would attempt, she would try. And then there came uh, that certain day and that certain time uh, whereby that she laid hold upon him and, and compelled him, come and lie with me. But Joseph would not and he even ran out of his coat. But before he did, he said, how can I commit this great great sin against God. Amen. Now, yes, he would be sinning against Potiphar. uh, Potiphar uh, had placed him over all of his house. Potiphar didn't even know what he had in his house, but what he ate. That's what the Scripture says. Amen. That's the only thing he knew about what he had in his house because Joseph was over it all. Joseph was the chief accountant. He was the chief attendant. He was the chief overseer. Uh, he, he was running the show, if you please. It was in Joseph's hand. Potiphar had complete confidence in him. And Joseph said, My master's not held, withheld anything from me but his wife. And, and which that was right. Uh, uh, that he should not. Uh, but whenever he said that... Uh, he didn't say that, that, that how can I sin against Potiphar? He said, how can I sin against God? First and foremost, it would be a sin against His God. Amen. I heard an old elder years ago. He joined the church as a young boy and through his teenage years and come up in the church. And he said he believed that that experience and come, being a member of the church and coming up through the church that it saved him. Uh, from a lot of things that he could have got into because when he would think about it, the temptations would be there and all for doing wrong, which would be in a public offense. He would think of them old brethren and say, what confidence they have in me and they took me in and they loved me. How can I sin against God and how can I sin against my brethren? 
Right. Amen. When, when I believe when children come of enough mind and understanding, and they can realize uh, that they love the Lord uh, and, and they love God's people, uh, uh, let's don't discourage them. Now, I, I'm certainly against infant baptism. Uh, I, I, I preach you a sermon on that if God will help me. Amen. I want to tell you, there's been, you, you know, you know why, how the, and why the most bloodshed has been shed back through the last 2,000 years? It's been shed over the subject matter of baptism and particularly infant baptism. Amen. I want to tell you, the old brethren would not give their children up to be baptized. It didn't matter how many of uh, uh, the uh, the monks, uh, uh, there were hundreds killed in one day in Wales uh, because they wouldn't give their children over to the Catholics uh, uh, to be baptized. Uh, uh, it, 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 it was a serious matter. Uh, I, I don't believe in baptizing babies and I don't believe in baptizing children that don't quite understand exactly what they're doing. But but don't discourage them. Uh, keep encouraging them and, and, and prompting them along. And, and as soon as they're showing forth the fruit, if mom and daddy says they're showing forth fruit, uh, uh, that the Lord has done a work in them and they love the Lord, uh, and mom and daddy's bringing them to church, uh, amen, bring them in the church and let them grow up in the church. Uh, somebody say amen. Uh, let them grow up in the church. Uh, it can save them right here. Uh, you know, anytime you see the word saved, it ain't just necessarily talking about saved for heaven more to glory. Matter of fact, most of the time you see the word save, save for salvation, it's talking about temporal, timely deliverance. Right, right. Oh, and I want to tell you there is there is a saving in baptism. Yeah. Thank God. It's not for it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Amen. But it's the answering of good conscience. Hey, the phone's ringing, answer it. Yeah. Amen. That good conscience is ringing. You need to answer it. Amen. Amen. Answer that phone. Answer that good conscience. That God's made good. God's made the conscience good. And then you need to answer it. That's, I believe that's, that's the formula. Amen. That's the order that the Scriptures lay down for us and unto us. So, so Joseph, he would not sin against the Lord. I hope just a few more minutes if you'll stay with me. Most of you look like you're awake, so I appreciate that. So, yeah, we're not going to we're not going to get but maybe to one more here, and I, I won't. I'll, I'll try not to be too long winded with it, but I, I do want to turn over. I want to turn over to Genesis chapter two and go to verse fifteen. This is in the very uh, those very early days of time uh, there in Genesis in the beginning. That's what the word Genesis means, in the beginning. <laughs> Amen. In the beginning, thank God, He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the first. He's the last. He's before all things, after all things, and in between all things. Amen. Thank God forevermore. Oh, it's wonderful. We ought to boast. Paul talked about he would not boast, but in the Lord. He boasted on the Lord. We need to glory in the Lord and praise His holy name. And so God created Adam, and God brought him. The God took him and, and put him into the garden. I don't know exactly where God created him, the geographical place. Somewhere's over there in that Middle East. I feel pretty confident of it. Uh, somewhere's in that area uh, where uh, Abraham walked upon and God gave unto him and his posterity under that old covenant and so forth. Uh, but after God, uh, God created him and, and brought him forth, uh, formed him, uh, made him from the dust to the ground, then the Lord God took the man. That's in Genesis chapter 2 and in verse 15. God took the man. That's in the sense that God took him by the hand and led him. God took him by the hand and led him into the Garden of Eden. God took the man. You ever notice that wording just like that? It's right there. Amen. How wonderful it is. God just took him by the hand and led him right in the garden. For you see, God created him for the garden. God put him right where He created him for. And uh, I tell you, the old brethren, our forefathers, and on back through uh, the centuries uh, uh, of articles of faith, uh, and this expression our brethren have used, uh, that God created Adam able to stand, but liable to fall. God created him with a liability. 
And, and, and the proof is in the pudding. As I've said before, the reason I know uh, uh, that he was able to fall was because he did. <laughs> Amen. Was because he did. Now that's the proof of it. If, he, if, if God hadn't created him able to fall, he wouldn't have failed. And God sure did not predetermine for him to fall. God did not predetermine his sin. God did not predetermine uh, that he should disobey. Now I'm a long ways from a religious fatalist. And you know what we call a religious fatalist? That's what an absolute is. That's what absoluters are called. There's been that streaked head among so-called primitive Baptists back through the, the times and known as absoluters, that God predetermined whatsoever comes to pass, good or bad, and it couldn't be any other way. Well, I don't hold to that. I don't believe that. Amen. I believe that God predestinated a people. He predetermined their destination before the foundation of the world and predestinated them to be conformed to the image of the Son of God and predestinated them unto the adoption of children. Right. Now that's what the Scriptures teach. Yeah. Amen. Now I'm a firm believer in providence and I don't believe that you should do harm. You shouldn't fight against absolutism so hard that you do violence to providence. Right. Right. Amen. Don't, you know, yeah, right. you, know, you know, the absolute is over here in this ditch. Yeah. Well, we don't need to get over there in that ditch. Because you know why? If you're in the ditch, you're in the ditch. Yeah. And it don't matter which one it is. All right, we've got to be in the middle of the road of truth. Amen. Now the old absoluter says that there is nothing gained in obedience, and there is nothing lost in disobedience. Now that's a false statement. That is not the truth. I want to tell you for the child of God, there is much to be gained. There is much profit. There is much benefit. I'm going to go a little further. Don't let me scare you. Amen. There is much reward. Now you got time after a while. We can talk about a whole bunch of text. Amen. They have that word in it. And it's not talking about heaven and immortal glory. Right. You know, when somebody tells me that somebody died and went on to their reward, I say within myself, I sure hope not. Amen. I sure hope not. I hope when I die, I don't go to my reward. You understand that? Amen. Because... Uh, I'll, I'll be like the fellow he thought he was going up through the attic, but he went down through the basement. <laughs> Amen. I'm afraid that's, that, I'm afraid that's what will be happening uh, if we go to our reward. But I want to tell you, the Scriptures talk about much about reward right here in this life in a way of obedience. And we don't do it. To, uh, they're, they're, the reward uh, is, is, is not for the doing, it's in the doing. That's just like in feet washing. Amen. The happiness is in the doing. Happy are you if you do it. So the blessing and the reward is in the doing, not far. Because when we've done all that we should, we're still yet in His sight. We're still an unprofitable servant. Because I want to tell you, He's such a thrice holy God. But oh, but there are blessings in obedience that God teaches throughout His Word that God teaches. And there was blessings for Adam that if he would dress and keep the garden. Amen. That if he would do what God said, that if he would obey God, that if he would uh, not partake of and eat of that tree in the, which was also in the midst of the garden, the tree of, no, of knowledge knowing good from evil. Now, they could eat of the tree of life. Oh yes, they could eat of that tree. Oh, while they were there in that garden. And all the other trees and the other and the herbs that God gave forth and, and, and herbs that God gave for animals. You know, even before the fall, when I read that text, I think about it, it looks like to me that uh, uh, even those animals now that we know as, as meat eaters, they were eating grass. You understand? Amen. They were eating herbs because there was no fall. There was no curse upon the ground. Uh, There uh, was not the change that took place. Uh, After a man disobeyed, God told Adam, He took him by the hand, He led him, He took him, the man, and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress and to keep it. Amen. I believe here that dress and keep is the same and the emphasis is upon the keep. Amen. Now there's a lot of things that I don't know and understand about that, and I'm sure you don't either. 
I can't cross every T and I can't dot every I upon that. Amen. But I want to tell you, in dressing and keeping, there's the context in it of keeping God's law. Right. Amen. Of keeping God's commandment. And in doing that, Adam would be keeping the way right. to the tree of life. That's right. He would be keeping the way to the tree of life. Now the Lord is our tree of life now. Yeah. And now we've got to keep the way to the tree of life. I ain't talking about in an eternal sense. I'm talking about in the sense that we have got to, to live a life of discipleship, a life that is honoring and obedient, amen, unto the Lord, uh, that we can have fellowship, uh, that we can have the benefits and the blessings of the tree of life. You understand where I'm coming from? Yes. I'm doing my best tonight by God's help to rightly divide the Word of God. Amen. To separate it out. To put it in the right buckets. <laughs> Amen. To put it in the right categories. Amen. That's what the Scripture admonishes us and teaches us to do. So, so He was to dress it and to keep it. Now, before, the, before He failed... Before sin, for by one man sin entered the world. How did sin get here? It came by Adam. Right. It wasn't by God's predetermination for sin. No, but God knew what He was going to do. God knew Adam was going to do it. God was not surprised. After Adam sinned, and, and once again, God come down in the cool of the day as God had before and to walk with Him and to commune with Him, Adam didn't show up. Why? Because there's something different. Now, he's afraid and hiding. And they've even tried to sew together fig leaves to hide their nakedness. Why? Because Adam was created good and very good, but now that they eat of that tree of good, uh, of, of knowledge of knowing good and evil, uh, uh, now he knew that he was naked. He now knew uh, and, and was trembling and fearing before God because he was unclothed. Not just for his, his body, but in ever since. But thank God, God did call him Adam. Adam. I believe when God called him there, God wasn't trying to find him. God knew where he was. Now I don't have a text for this, but the Bible says that God will have the preeminence in all things. And I just can't help but believe that the first man that God created, the man that God created, of course all of the rest has come by procreation. I never can say that word. Procreation. Amen. By descent. Amen. Adam's posterity. All right, but I, I promise you, uh, it is my firm conviction that Adam, his his body somewhere decayed on this earth, but I believe his soul and spirits in glory. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I, I, I that's my sense of it. That's that's where I stand. If you don't believe that, that's okay. We're not going to fall out. Amen. But I believe Adam is in glory. I believe God called him out of that state of dead and trespassing sin when He said, Adam. Adam, God called him forth. I tell you, at that time when God's time, when God is pleased, ever elect, through the course of time, God's going to call them, amen, by His life-giving voice, amen, by the Spirit of God, by the sovereign Spirit of God. As, as the Lord told Nicodemus, the wind bloweth where it listeneth. Thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whether it cometh or whether it goeth. So is Adam. Everyone that is born of the Spirit of God. Amen. There's too many people in this world trying to tell God's people that God's got a hundred different ways of born in His people again. God has only one way. It's for the infant in the womb. It's for the toddler. It's for the adult. It's for the aged individual. Amen. Amen. That's in God's hand, but they're all born by the Sovereign Spirit. They're all born because God, amen, purposed it. Jesus paid for it. And the Holy Ghost. You see, there's perfect unity in the Trinity. Amen. Uh, there's perfect work. The perfect work in mind. The mind of the Trinity is one. There won't be one born of the Spirit that the Father did not purpose to save and Jesus died for. And every one that God the Father purposed to save and Jesus died for will be born of the sovereign Spirit of God. The wind bloweth where it listen. The wind bloweth where it pleases. You can't harness the wind. You can't summon the wind. That's what he's talking about. 
Amen. God blows in His time and how He pleases and where He pleases. Amen. God uh, does this work. So in verse 16 of chapter 2, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Brother Mike and I had great conversation upon it, and he emphasized that point right there. I believe I'm giving credit where credit's due. Amen. The Word, the word of God says it, and Brother Mike emphasized it. Amen. God didn't tell Adam... If you eat of it, God knew He was going to eat. Right. And that's why God said, right there, for in the day, yeah. you're going to do it. He's telling him right there, you're going to do it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. God gave him a solemn warning. God told him to keep the way. That's right. Dress and keep. Keep the way to the tree of life. Keep it possible. Amen. For you to keep eating of the tree of life. Because after that took place, we find then after God had given out the sentences of judgment upon the woman and upon man and upon the serpent and so forth, the Bible says uh, in chapter 3, uh, starting there in verse uh, 21, unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. This is God's fatherly, providential uh, care, uh, amen, of, of, of the sacrifice of, of the animals and taking their skins and covering them up. Uh, this is the first representation. And this is the first type and shadow of pointing, uh, amen, to the Lamb of God amen. that uh, would cover our nakedness. Right. Amen. I speak figuratively. In verse 22 he says, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. God says he don't need to and he's not going to live forever in this state that he's in. Even though he'd been born again, but now he had his own Adamic nature, which he would pass on for we're conceived in sin and shapen in iniquity, as the Bible said. So Adam is our federal head. He is our representative. All that Adam represented. It, and that for by one, this is Romans chapter 5, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. And so by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. Right. How many did Adam make sinners? All that he represented. All his posterity, he made sinners. So, how many does Jesus make righteous? All that he represents. Amen. All that the Father gave him. That's how many he makes righteous. Amen. We need to understand this principle. This first Adam, he was of the earth, and I know I didn't preach an hour, forgive me. He was of the earth, earthly. But this, but this second man, this He's the second man, but he's the last Adam. Right. He's the last one we... <laughs> oh, my Lord, have mercy, I'm getting happy again. He's the last Adam. He's the last one. He's the last one that His people needs. The first Adam messed us up, but this last Adam, He sets the record straight. Amen. He makes reconciliation. He makes peace by the blood of His cross. Amen. As the Scripture teaches, He made satisfaction unto a thrice holy God. So therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed him at the east of the garden of Eden, cherubims. This is plural, S, cherubims. And a flaming sword which turned every way, every direction, North, south, east, west. It may have been there was four. I'm not saying there was. But this is the way I kind of look at this myself. There's four cherubims there. Each one facing the different way. They've got the flaming sword. And if the man comes from the north, the cherubim guarding the way from the north takes the sword, holds it up. If he comes from the south, the cherubim guarding the way from the south takes the sword, runs him off. So forth. You understand? You get the picture. All right. Amen. What is it? And what are they doing? What are these cherubims doing? And it turned every way to do what? To keep. 
to keep the way of the tree of life. Amen. God had told Adam to dress and keep it. He didn't do it. He failed. And that disobedience cost him. And it cost the whole human family. But then God set His holy cherubims to keep the way to the tree of life. And I want to tell you, that way has been preserved, that way has been kept by God Almighty, preserved in Jesus Christ as our tree of life. Amen. And there is a way in a temporal sense that we eat of Him here in this life. And there's that all, that way also in an eternal context and way. Amen. That He is our tree of life. That He is our life. That our life is hid in Him. And that we have this spiritual life. We have this born again experience. Amen. Because of Jesus Christ. You know the only thing I know to do is just close this Bible and quit. God bless you tonight is my prayer. Thank you for your kind attention and forgive me for being long-winded.